All right, gentlemen, we're on page 938. 938. And uh, this is where we were speaking about Moshe Rabbeinu is, uh, is giving rebuke. Moshe Rabbeinu is giving rebuke to the Jewish people. And uh, uh, he's telling the Jewish people about the various things that they complained about and the things that they were, uh, they were uh, um, 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 what do you call it, they, uh, uh, disloyal in various places. The Torah mentions these places, and the last time we spoke about how he, he's alluding to them very, uh, he's just alluding to them. Now, the, 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 underlying, the underlying principle here is really a Jewish principle. Why, I mean, the Jewish people who are... Or what do you call it? The, they're, they're being taken out of. By, they see Hashem. Hashem has done these miracles for them. How is it? You know, and you always got to wonder if you've seen it. We always think to ourselves, well, if they would do miracles for me, I'd also, you know, I'd also be a believer. I, you know, wh- how difficult is it to 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 to, to, to you, you got everything. Hashem's laying it out for you. You got manna from heaven, and you got water in the well. So where is it that the where, where is the flaw here? Where how, how do you ever get flaw? How did you ever uh, 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 end up if it's so blatantly obvious. And the answer is that e- even nowadays, you know, things things are obvious to us too. You got to open our eyes and look, and you'll see it. Um, but there's always a there's never a point that a person gets to where we're home free. You know, there's always going to be a pull in the other direction. Uh, there's a, I, I told you a story once. The story of this guy, there's a guy uh, decides to rob a bank, <clears throat> which is a good part also, by the way. You know, the, 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 <laughs> don't, don't knock it until you try it. So the uh, guy decides he's going to rob a bank. And so, <coughs> sorry, he comes up with a great idea. To rob a bank, you can't just walk in and rob a bank. So he goes and he puts on a police uniform. And he walks into the bank, he's wearing a police uniform, walks in, and, you know, nobody suspects a policeman. So he comes walking into the bank. And he walks up to the counter and he pulls out his he pulls out a, a gun and he holds the gun and he says, Okay, lady, fill up fill up the sack with money. There's a guy behind him wearing a dirty t shirt and blue jeans, and he's an undercover cop. And he takes the gun and he sticks it in the guy's gut. He says, You're under arrest. I got you right there. Okay? So he arrests this guy right when he's robbing the bank. And uh, now he takes, doesn't want the guy to run away, so he takes out a pair of handcuffs and he handcuffs himself to this guy and he's going to walk him down to this police station. So there they are walking down to the police station. This guy's wearing a police uniform and this other guy's wearing a shirt, t shirt, and jeans. And they're on the way to the police uniform. And as they're walking towards the police uniform, the undercover cop has a next door neighbor and he comes walking towards them. Now, what he sees is he sees his next door neighbor being handcuffed to a policeman. So the neighbor, as he walks by, kind of, you know, gives him, kind of, kind of, you know, opens his eyes a little wide. And so the, the undercover cop says to him, no, Bill, Bill, I know what you're thinking. I, I, it, this isn't what you're thinking. You see, I, I happen to be an undercover cop. I've never been able to tell you. And this guy was robbing a bank, and I arrested him, and I'm taking him to the police station. Now, the other guy is in trouble, so he's not going to make his life easier. So he says to the neighbor, now, you don't really believe that story, do you? I mean, look at me and look at him. And we're, you know, I'm taking him to the police station. He says, Bill, I'm telling you, I'm an undercover cop. He says, they don't believe that kind of nonsense. They go back and forth. Finally, the undercover cop says, listen, there's only one way to prove it. The guy who's got the key to the handcuffs, he's the guy who's in control. Is he pulling me or I'm pulling him? He says, let's see the key to the handcuffs. And the cop says, I haven't got him. He says, yeah, well, I do. And he pulls out the key. He says, I've got the key to the handcuffs. I'm in control. He says, that's the test that we're always going through, is we're being pulled, and we're doing, there's a tug of war going on between us and what we call the eight Sahara, the evil inclination. There's a constant tug of war. The determining factor is who's in control, right? Am I in control? He's there, and he's pulling, and we're pulling back. We're, we're, we're constantly pulling. By the way, you'll notice he's there very early in the morning. Right? He gets up at Nate's. I mean, the eight Sahara is up at Nate's. So when your alarm clock goes off, you're supposed to go to Minion, and you want to sleep later, right? He's pulling you down. I once heard a golden piece of advice, by the way. When you get up in the morning, you want to sleep late. You want to sleep more. You may have to, but the first step is get horizontal. First, get horizontal, and then make the decision. Don't make the decision ver- vertical, because uh, sorry, get vertical. Don't get no, sorry, sorry. <laughs> get horizontal. You are horizontal. Get vertical. When you're vertical, then you could make the decision. Should I, you need to sleep more? So sleep more. 
But if you're very, very, if you're making the decision when you're horizontal, then it's a, you, you know you, you haven't even got it. You you're, not, you're 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 imprisoned, and therefore, no matter what's going on over here, no matter what happens, what the Israel have seen, because Baruch has done this nace, that nace, that all the miracles. At the end of the day, there is always a counterforce, and that's what we have to remember. In the counterforce, the question is, who's in control? Are we in control? Or is the counterforce in control? That's the that's the battle. Now, if you take a look at Pusik Dalit on page 940, so it says like this. Acharea Koso Esichon Melacha Mori Asher Yoshev Bechashbon, the Isok Melacha Bosha and Asher Yoshev Beashtaros Beidre. This all takes place after Moshe Rabbeinu has killed these two mighty kings. There is Sichon, which the Torah reports at the end of Sefer Bamidbor. There's Sichon and there's Og, these two mighty kings that Moshe Rabbeinu kills before they go into Eretz Yisrael. Now, why, the, the, the first time ask over here, why would the Torah be repeating this? We, we just learned this in Parshas Mase. The Torah goes and tells us, uh, t- t- tells us that Moshe Rabbeinu killed Sichon and Og. Why is the Torah repeating this now and telling us this is all, all this rebuke is taking place after Moshe Rabbeinu killed Sichon and Og? So uh, the first time explain, well, you know, if you're going to rebuke somebody, if you're gonna, you know, sometimes you gotta say something unpleasant. Make sure you do something for them first. Right? It, it's always easier to receive rebuke. If you want to rebuke me, feel free to rebuke me, gentlemen. Give me twenty bucks, right? And then rebuke me. I'll I'll accept your rebuke gladly, right? But first, but first, do something for me. Now, the question that the Mefarshim should be asked, I mean, Moshe Rabbeinu, you gotta do something for the Jewish people. You've done an awful lot. You brought them out of Egypt. You've been leading them for forty years. And you still got, and you can't rebuke them until you remind them, oh, what I did for you with Sicha and Og. You know what the answer is? Yeah, that's right. right. What did you do for me today? Right. Otherwise, how do you explain a ball player who's won championships getting booed? Right. What did you do for me today? Right. I don't care what you did yesterday. What did you do for me today? So Moshe, even a Moshe Rabbeinu who's going to go and rebuke the Jewish people. But what did you do for me now? I know what you did. You took, you split the sea, and that was all very impressive. I'm mean, terrific. What did you do for me now? More than that. If you look at the word cheshbon, what does cheshbon mean, gentlemen? What's that? Calculation. An accounting, a calculation. Okay. A cheshbon is a calculation. Sichon is the king of cheshbon. Og is the king of Bashan. <coughs> <coughs> which is in a place called Asteros Be'edrei. Edrei is the Aramaic word for an arm. So you've got the king of calculation and the king of the arm. That's really what it comes out to. We put on tefillin. Where do you put on tefillin? One goes on the head and one goes on the arm. Why? Why we put? Why we bind tefillin to ourselves? You bind them on your head, you bind them on your arm. Why? What's the symbolism? That we want that our thoughts and our actions should be under control, should be devoted to Hashem. That's the thoughts in the air. Moshe Rabbeinu, this is the last act he's going to do for the Jewish people. He kills Sichon and Og. The rest, he's gone. He's not going into Eretz Yisrael with them. So Moshe Rabbeinu is staying on the other side on the occupied East Bank. Moshe Rabbeinu is staying on the other side of the Yarde. The last thing he does for the Jewish people is he kills Sichon, Melech Hezbon, and Og, Melech Abashan. In other words, whatever spiritual forces there are, contaminating thought and action, Moshe Rabbeinu puts a, some sort of neutralizes them so that the Jewish people will not be subject to that influence before they go into Eretz Yisrael. And therefore the Torah emphasizes Sichon and Og. Okay, now if you take a look in Pasuk, um, Pasuk Hay. Be'ever ha'yardain, be'eretz mo'av ho, Moshe be'er es ha'torah zos lemor. Moshe Rabbeinu on the other side of the yard begins clarifying the Torah. If you notice, Rashi says, it's the right column of Rashi, seven lines from the bottom. If you find it, please show the person next to you. Be'er es ha'torah. <coughs> says Rashi, what does that mean? He clarified the Torah. Moshe Rabbeinu, how did the Yaretz go translate it? Moshe Rabbeinu began explaining the Torah. Okay, explain the Torah, clarify. How did he explain the Torah? Take a look at Rashi. Be'er es ha'torah, says Rashi, Beshivim lashon per in seventy different languages. Can you imagine seventy languages? How many languages do you know, gentlemen? And I know some guy, I know a guy who you know knows eight languages. You know, it's French, Spanish, English. Is that seventy languages? And seven? And he explained the whole Torah. 
I mean, even in one language to explain the Torah takes a while. Right? Take you a while. In one day, he explained the entire Torah in 70 different languages? Okay, so we're obviously talking about something that's beyond our comprehension. Some of the first him say that 70 languages doesn't mean 70 languages. Did you ever, did you ever hear, hear the idea there's shivim panim la Torah? There are 70 different ways to understand Torah. That everything, there are different layers of understanding of Torah. I think the Vilna Gaon says, the Vilna Gaon once woke up in the morning, he said, he understood the Pasuk, he, under, he had 1,180 different approaches to explaining that Pasuk. How do you like that, Mayor? Thousand, a thousand something approach in which he dreamed at night. Woke up in the morning and he had a thousand different, over a thousand different different ways to approach a puzzle. So we see there's an expression called Shivim Panim La Torah. There's 70 different explanations for Torah. And by the way, it's not limited to 70. 70 is just a number. There are endless, endless layers of understanding, endless layers of depth, uh, depth of Torah. So Moshe Rabbeinu explains it in 70 languages. Now, the question is why? Let's say it means languages. Why? Why would you have to explain it in 70 languages? And, and communication, I mean, this is, you know, even husbands and wives think that there are different languages, right? Husbands and wives speak the same language in their communication issues. Right? That, that's, uh, you know, ask any husband and wife combination. You know, oh, you know, it's like a wife says to her husband, uh, you know, somebody once said, women think communication means agreeing with them. So wife says to her husband, do you think we should get a new couch? He says, no, I don't think we need one. We're just not communicating, you know. And I thought that was great communication, you know. You asked and I said no. Now what was it, what aren't we communicating here? The answer is because when she was asking, she wasn't asking, she was saying. Right? Is it true or not true? That's what you will find. Uh, how many of you are married, by the way? None of you. Okay. You'll find you are married. Uh-huh. Okay. So you will find that that <laughs> he's sitting in the back. Yeah, yeah, there you go. I got to be careful here because this is on video. You know, my wife may watch this. But yeah, you should know. You should know that one day, and one day you should pay me for this. Like you, you, you should know a husband comes home and he says to his wife, uh, you want to go out to eat tonight? And she says, what do you mean? Right? And I'm like, well, do you want to go with me to eat? You know, what wasn't clear, what wasn't clear about what I said? And I tell you, true or not true, right? You say to your wife, you want to go out tonight? What do you mean? Well, what could I have possibly meant, right? Now, what she thinks you might have meant is you either don't like her cooking, or you don't like her mother, or you don't like it. It could be any one of several things, right? So now, why, and why is it, you know, you know why? Uh, it's, it's like, guys, I'll give you a tip, and you should pay me for this. Kaplan, K-A-P-L-A-N, would make out the checks with a K. Kaplan with a K. I'll give you a tip. If you're white, white when you come home, you come home one day, and your wife looks up and sees you, do the lights, do the lights look dim in this room? Right, right. Now you know what that means. Change the light bulb. No, no. That means she wants to go out to eat. What? Yeah, yeah. Oh, see, seventy languages. Ah, why? Why? Because well, I'll, I'll tell you exactly how. Because when you come in, and you look at the lights, and you know that the lights don't look dim, and she's asking if the lights look dim. And what she really means is, I've been in locked up in the house all day, and I really want to get out. And if we're going to go out, I want to eat. And therefore, the response when she says, "Do the lights look dim?" the response is, "Milchiks or Fleischiks." That, that, that's the correct response, because that's that now. Which is why when no, you're laughing, but I'm telling you why. I'm telling you because which is why when you say to your wife, "You want to go out to eat?" she says, "What do you mean?" Because she would never say it that way. She would say, do the lights look dim? So when you say, you know, in other words, why talk straight if you could talk like this? You know, and this is where all, this is where all, the, all the trouble begins, right? And, or shouldn't say begins, and continues, all right? That's the continue. So Moshe Rabbeinu goes 70 languages, which are all easier to explain, to understand than that one language, right? 70 different languages, okay? Why? Why? Why do you think the Torah, why, why, what's the point? If the Torah tells us this, there's got to be a reason why. Why do you have to do 70 different languages or 20 isn't enough? Why 70 different languages? The answer is, anybody got an idea? Why 70 different languages? 70 nations. Oh, and therefore what? So each one, so all of them understand the message. All of them get the message. But this is being said to the Jewish people. So this they can said. bring certain message to the other people. Okay, and so they can understand, they can bring the message to the other nations. Possibly, possibly. I'll tell you, we're going to get to that in a second. It's a message to the Jewish people. Torah is not limited to Eretz Yisrael. 
One day you may go into Golis, and you may be in that nation, you may be in France, and you may be in Argentina, and you may be in what do you call it, you may be in Scotland. Wherever you are, in whatever language they speak, Torah still applies over there. No matter where you're going to be, seven Torah is going to spread. It's not limited to Eretz Yisrael. Wherever you're going to be, number one. Number two, at a deeper spiritual level, it's to cut down the negative forces of all the 70 languages, of the 70 nations. Right? But without even getting into that, it's a reminder to us that, now, let's go to what you said. Have you ever heard the idea that Jewish people are meant to be a light unto the nations? Okay, so there are those that think that our job is to go out and to start teaching the other nations, right? But if you, if you know anything about it, all you gotta do is pick up any newspaper or magazine. And half, if you pick up Time Magazine, I don't know if you guys know what a magazine is nowadays, you know, nowadays a magazine is this, you know, we grew up, we grew up, do any know what this is, by the way? This, have you seen, this is a pen. Right, this is called a pen. This is not a back scratcher. This is a pen. Yeah, we actually we actually use it. We grew up. Mike, remember we used to have, we, 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 we used to use these, right? Were you still were you around at the time when they had telephones that actually had a dial like this? Yeah, they were up on the wall and you had to dial it like that. And if you got a busy signal, you had to dial it again, guys. It was like, but we made it. Here we are. Yeah, how, how do you like that? Right. So we 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 made it. So so the 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 idea is. If you look at a Time magazine, it looks like a who's who in the Jewish world. Look in finance, it's all about Jews. Politics is all about Jews. Uh, what do you call it? Sports is all about Jews. The owners, the owners, the uh, the agents, right? It's all about Jews. The what do you call it? crime? It's all about Jews, right? Everywhere you go, everywhere you look, you're going to see the Jews. Why? Because the world's focused on the world sees us. And when it says to be enlightened by, you know how we're enlightened to the nations. By behaving the way we should behave with ourselves, the nations will all see it. We don't have to go out there. And we don't have to preach and we don't have to teach them. They'll find us. They see us. They're always focused on us. Far more, out of, far out of proportion, far out of proportion to any other nation, the Jews are being focused on. That's why the Russians are allowed to go bomb Ukrainian civilian centers. But if a Jew, if a, if a Jew opens up a balcony and in the and the West Bank, then the whole United Nations gets uh, is up in arms, right? Civil rights violations because you opened up a because you built a new because you built a balcony, you added a balcony you know, where the Russians are bombing hospitals, but that's that's perfectly okay. And if you if they're knocking out Hutsis and Tutsis by the millions or whatever's going on, nobody in the world cares. But if a Jew if a Jew does one, oh, the whole world's focus. They'll always see us. They always see us. They'll always find us. And since they always find us to be a light to the nation, 70 languages, that's not for them. That's for us. That we have to learn Torah and we have to behave like Jews. If we behave like Jews, the world, they'll find us. They'll see us. They'll find us. No, no, no problem. Guaranteed. Okay. Take a look at Pasuk Yud. So the Torah says, in this, a, a, a really, really remarkable idea. Um, uh, it's the bottom of page 940, gentlemen. I want to show you a remarkable idea here. And something we spoke about in the past, but uh, it's, it's uh, I think we mentioned, I don't remember we mentioned it last week. <coughs> Sorry. It says, Hashem elokeichem hereba eschem, Hashem has increased you. V'hinchem ayom kikochvei Hashemayim l'rov. You are now abundant like the stars. So the Jewish people are compared to the stars. Kochavim are stars. Why is it that the Jewish people are compared to stars. Why are we compared to stars? What's, what, what's it got to be? I want to give you... Somebody got an idea? Yes. Why? So, normally it says we compare to stars that we think it means that we are as many as the stars. In reality, we are the smallest nation and there are billions of stars. So how could you even compare the two? Okay. So there's different sheets. The fact, you might okay. say one or two of them? We'll say one. Tell you what. So, the Vashem actually says, that each star is minute and small, yet it's greater than Earth itself. So every Jew that you think is not any Excellent, excellent, is excellent, excellent. Yeah. Very good, very good. That means like this. Yeah, that gets a psh. Yeah, that gets a psh. Yeah, get, get a good lot of psh. Yeah, there you go. That means like this. Yeah, what's your name? Adam Walkins. Abram? Walkins. Where, where in Brooklyn are you from? I am from Rockaway, but uh -huh. my uncle is Rabbi Small. Uh -huh. oh, oh, from Chicago. Yes. Oh, there we go. He's got Yichos. There you go. He's got Yichos. The, uh, the accent. There you go. The, uh, what do you call it? The, 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 he's saying a very important idea. The idea is like this. If you look at a star, star looks like a teeny little dot. I want to tell you an, uh, an amazing medrash. You know, the Gemara says King Paro, the most powerful emperor in the ancient world, was one Amma tall. 
an amma is 18 inches, maybe. So the Gemara says Paro was 18, uh, was, it was eight, it was an amma tall. King Nebuchadnezzar, the most powerful emperor in the ancient world, you know how tall he was? The Medrash says he was katan kikat, he was the size of a jug. <laughs> right? That's even smaller than an amma. So now it's an interesting statement. You stop and think about this. The, most, the two most powerful emperors in the ancient world, one is described as being the size of an ama, and the other one is the size of a jug. I guess on the resume, when you applied for job of emperor, you know, one of the qualifications, you can walk under the table without bending your knees, then you're qualified. That way you can bite the enemy right in the shins, right? And, and so, so they're intimidated by you. So what, what are they, if the Gemara says something like that, the Medjur says something, they obviously, obviously, literally, I don't think that Nebuchadnezzar was the size of a jug. Somebody once asked me, well, if Paro was one ama tall, Gemara says he was one ama tall. How tall was Moshe Rabbeinu? Ten avos. So why don't you just step on them? Right? You know, he's like, no, you can't leave. Yeah, oh yeah, crunch. Yeah, next. Yeah. Right? So obviously, obviously, hold on the question a second. Oh, obviously, obviously, Moshe Rabbeinu, obviously the Medrash is trying to communicate an idea. You know why I understood this idea? I heard somebody speak once who was involved with Holly, was involved in show business. Became a Balchuva. He was involved in show business. He was rubbing elbows with very, very famous people. People, all these worldwide names. And when he got married at his own Sheva Brachas, he said, you know, I was, I knew these people well. The closer you got to them, the more you realize they're really very small people. That's when the coin dropped. That's why I understood the matters. You could be a Paro and you could be a Nebuchadnezzar. And you're really a small person. You make an issue out of every little thing. You're, you, everything bothers you. You're never happy. You're really a very small person. A Jew, Unfortunately, you know when you find out what a Jew is? Unfortunately, when somebody dies, you go to a shiva house, you go to a house of mourning to comfort a mourning, and you find out, wow, you know, he gave that much. I didn't know he gave so much tzedakah. I didn't know he never missed a daf yomi shir in 40 years. I didn't know that every day he got to the shul early to put away the sedurim and to clean up the shul. You never know. I didn't know about it. When the more you find out about a Jew, you find out that's why it's called a star. A Jew's like a star. The closer you get, the bigger it becomes. Whereas these worldwide celebrities, the closer you get, the smaller they become, the more nauseated you become. And you find out that they find out there's really nothing there. And the Jew, the closer you get, the bigger he becomes. That's one idea. There's another idea. What about a Jewish celebrity? A Jewish celebrity? Um, the, yeah, well, a lot, most of them are. The, uh, the what do you call it? The, again, it, it, it depends, it, it really depends. When you get to a uh, Moshe Feinstein, or you get to a Rav Ovadi Yosef, or you get to any of the Jew, what I call Jewish celebrities, with the Gedolei Ador, the closer you get, the bigger they become. Much bigger. Uh, an empty celebrity also, you know, unfortunately, Jews could be empty celebrities too. And the bigger, you, the closer you get, the smaller they become. There's another idea here. There are billions of stars. They now sent up a satellite that they've been working on for 30 years, this telescope that, 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 that puts the Hubble telescope to shame. The this, this satellite is now, I think, six, six million light years from Earth, something like that, some ridiculous thing. And they see out into the, the areas that they've never seen before. They can see things that they've never seen before. And there are just galaxies with billions and billions and billions of stars, trillions of stars. But one thing is clear about the stars. Who created them? Akash Baruch who created them. God created the stars. Every single star, they may look alike from a distance, he's got a different function. Every star, every Jew has a different function. That means no two Jews are exactly the same. What's the first mitzvah in the Torah? First mitzvah in the Torah would be fruitful and multiply. You know, what do we need so many people for? What do you need so many people for? Right? Why does, you know, a few is enough, a few is good. Right? You take a look at religious families, you got eight kids, 12 kids, 14 kids. I know a family with 17 kids. My upstairs neighbor has, has nine sons and seven daughters. Yeah, that's 16. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're all married. They all have grandchildren. Each one has at least three or four grandchildren. Wow. It's not a family, it's a tribe. Right? <laughs> you know, Bli and Hara. I know one family, I know there's a family here, there's a family here. One husband, one wife have 20 kids. There was a lady in Israel who got on a bus once. You know, they used to have the bus, you got the punch cards, you got on the bus, you had a punch, 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 punch. So she gets on, she gets on with 10 kids. She gets on and the guy goes, punch, 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 the driver goes, punch, he says, lady, next time, do me a favor, uh, leave half your kids at home. She says, I did. 
I have 20. <laughs> so, so you know, you, know you, 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 wonder, you wonder. By the way, I heard about this. This Siddish guy was with his wife. They're walking down the streets of Mayor Sharm. You've seen this. You know, they got, they're pushing the baby stroller. And they got, you know, you know, seven, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, all, all, all around. So there were these two German tourists. They see this Hasidic couple with a bunch of kids. So one of this, tur this German tourists, he says, well, don't you think you're being selfish bringing so many, so many people into the world? So he says, yes, you're right. We are selfish, and we'll stop when we hit six million. <laughs> right? Wow. Yeah, yeah, nice. So, so when, 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 what do you call it? When, when uh, 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 there, it, there's so many. But every single Jew has a different function. No two Jews, why, do we, why does Hashem say be fruitful and multiply? Why do we need more people and more Jews? The answer is that you could have, two, you have twins. You have twin brothers, twin sisters. They're not the same. One was born sooner, one was born later. Each one has a different personality. Each one of us, with our unique life circumstances, becomes an individual Kiddush Hashem. If you serve HaKadosh Baruch Hu your way, and you serve your way, and I serve my way, and you serve your way, and each one of us serves to the fullest of our potential, based on our talents, abilities, life circumstances, challenges, ordeals, whatever we go through, each person is an individual Kiddush Hashem. You have to remember that. And the same way that with billions of stars, no two stars have the same function, no two Jews have the exact same function. And you could learn Gemara Baba Kama, and you could learn Gemara Baba Kama, and your Baba Kama is one type of Kiddush Hashem, and your Baba Kama is another type of Kiddush Hashem. And every Jew has a different function. That's number two. Number three, when were the stars created? I will tell you an unbelievable story. There was a yeshiva in the United States. It's a yeshiva. I'm from Chicago. And uh, there was a yeshiva. They were drinking pop in yeshiva, right, on the, ro on the roof. The, uh, what do you call it? The, uh, there was a yeshiva in the United States. And they had a railing leading up to the second story. Second story from the second story. So one of the bachrim, one of the boys in the yeshiva, comes sliding down this banister. He goes zipping down the banister, which is what banisters are for, right? He comes zipping down this banister, and he's picking up speed, comes flying off the banister, and as he comes flying over there, he knocks over a little old man. He felt terrible, knocked this little old man over. Then he felt worse, because this little old man was Rebosha Feinstein's, that's all. Yeah, he just knocked over the Godelaw door. So, uh, you know, it's one of those moments in life where you're just kind of frozen. You just say, yeah, you know, so he helps Rebosha to his feet, and before he could even apologize, Reb Moshe says to him, please forgive me. I know you boys like to slide down the banister. I generally stand on the other side of the corridor. I'm sorry for standing here and blocking your slide. Please forgive me. And Reb Moshe turns around and he walks away. And the guy's like, what just happened? I just took out Reb Moshe and he apologized to me. The next day, he sees Reb Moshe and Reb Moshe does like this. He sees him, Reb Moshe sees him down the hall, he does like this. So the guy figures, okay, now he's going to give it to me good and proper. Yesterday he just let my heart start resume beating, and now he's going to give it to me for being a Vilda Chaya. So Reb Moshe calls the boy and says, please forgive me. I don't know what happened, why I was blocking your slide. Please forgive me. The guy's going, every time Reb Moshe saw him in the next two weeks, he kept apologizing. So the bachar is going out of his mind, and he goes over to the mashgiach of the yeshiva, Reb Michal Birnbaum, he says to me, you know, every time I knocked over Reb Moshe, and he keeps apologizing to me, what should I do? So Michal Berenbaum said to him, go to Reb Moshe tomorrow and ask him for a bracha. He'll give you a bracha, and once he gives you a bracha, he will feel that he will have atoned for his grievous misdeed of blocking your slide on the, on the banister. Okay, so the guy goes to the Moshe the next day, and Reb Moshe gives him a bracha. Okay. And then after that, he didn't apologize anymore. And I want to ask you a question. I want to ask you a question. Do you really think, do you really think that Reb Moshe thought that he did something wrong? You really think Reb Moshe thing right? I'm much more likely, much more likely that Reb Moshe, you know how, you know the, the mind works in a millionth of a second, a split second? I think that Reb Moshe, before he even hit the ground, knew he was going to get up and apologize. You know why? Because he can't let a 16-year-old yeshiva bacher dwell on the fact that he just knocked over the Godelah door. It could destroy a person emotionally. So before anything, Reb Moshe's first concern when he got up was, I got to make sure this guy is not going to be destroyed by realizing he knocked me over. That concern, that consideration, you know, Reb Moshe, again, somebody said to me, is this story true? First of all, it's true that I heard it, number one. Number two, like they say about, you know, they don't tell stories like that about me and you. Right? They tell stories about any story you hear about Reb Moshe, any lie you hear about him could be true, because that's the type of person he was. 
Why did I bring it up? You know what the difference is? You know, when did the stars get created? Thursday. What's that? Thursday. Third day. Why were they created? Remember, God created the Shteha Ma'oros HaGedol, created the sun and the moon equal. So the moon came to Hashem, and he said to Hashem, listen, you can't have two kings with one crown. So Hashem said, you're absolutely right. Go get reduced. We'll reduce your light. I'm sure the moon was thinking, mm, that, that's not where I was going with this. You know, <laughs> right? So the moon was reduced. And the moon says, says the measures, the moon felt bad. Now he, he used to be a big light, now he's a small light. So Hashem, in order to appease the moon, created the stars, gave him the stars, said, you're going to be in charge of the entire army. That means the very inception of stars, the whole point, the reason they were created was so that the moon should feel better. That's why the Jews are compared to stars. The idea of being compared to a star is in order that we should, our job in life is that those around us should feel better for our presence. And that our job in life is to pick people up instead of putting people down. And that the person, a person, what's that? What's that? It's an interesting shot. Is that the whole, where did stars come from? Stars were created in order to relieve somebody's pain. That's where stars were created. I'll tell you another, there's a, another yeshiva. There's a guy, uh, where are you guys from? Are you guys from Brooklyn? New York, Queens. Queens. So there's a, there's a yeshiva, <coughs> and one of these guys, there's a 16 year old bucher in the yeshiva who uh, started going through a frum stage. You know, he started telling everyone what they're doing wrong. You know, uh, uh, uh oh, you touch your shoes, you're chayv skila. You know, and one of those, you know, you know, and when he washed his hands, you know, he made sure to wash with a lot of water and take his time so people in line could be inconvenient. So when he benched, he benched real loud, you know, Davin, he was driving himself and everybody else nuts. And eventually he went out and bought himself a frock. You know, a frock is one of those long coats with two buttons on the back, and he's walking around with this frock, and the guys are laughing at him in the yeshiva, you're frummy, you're greasy, you're what, and I'm giving him a hard time. Okay. So one day he's at a drinking fountain, he's bent over the drinking fountain, and one of the other guys in the yeshiva sees this irresistible target. He's bent over, so he comes up behind him, slices him, right at the, at the drinking fountain, right? But it turned out it wasn't him, it was the Rosh Yeshiva. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, could you imagine? He just zinged, he zinged the Rosh Yeshiva. And I've heard the story from two different people, I know who the Rosh Yeshiva is. Now, just imagine, you know, what's it going to be? Which one of the four forms of Mises based in is it going to be? Skila, Shreifa, Herig, Chenek, what's it going to be? So Rosh Hashiva kept his, phone, his face in the water, and he said, Chaim, if anybody sees what you did, you're going to embarrass, get out of here as fast as you can. Never said a word to him about it. No punishment, no nothing. Now, do you think the Rosh Hashiva was embarrassed? Of course he's embarrassed. Rosh Hashiva's embarrassed. A guy slices the Rosh Hashiva, I'm sure he's embarrassed. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, He's more concerned for the bucher for the bucher than he is zingam. He's zingam. He's zingam. Like? You know what a zing is? Never seen anybody bent over and come over behind him and go zing. No? Oh, I guess you. I guess you're a better man than I, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Nowadays you hit him with a taser gun. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's all, yeah, yeah. It's all, so you know, we're, we've gotten more sophisticated. Yeah. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, the what he called, you know, he, he, the sensitivity. The sensitivity, but he's also going to be embarrassed. He's also going to be embarrassed. The most famous story about Ramosha Feinstein, which I'm sure many of you have heard, is that he got into a car on the way to the yeshiva. He got a ride. And when he got to the yeshiva, somebody saw me was holding his hands like this. So when he walked into the yeshiva, they said, why are you holding your hands? He says, when I got into the car, the guy who closed the door, he slammed the door on my fingers. He says, yeah, but you didn't yell. I didn't, you didn't hear a sound. You know, most people, if you get a door, chas v'shalom, somebody gets, should happen to all of our enemies soon. A uh, person gets their, gets their fingers caught in the door, gets their fingers caught in the door. You know, usually lots of people hear about it real quick. They said, yeah, but you didn't hear anything. He said, right, because I knew that if I would have yelled, the guy who closed the door would have been very embarrassed he closed the door on my fingers. Could you imagine? So I heard Rabbi Gottlieb once explained, it's very interesting. When a person's fingers get caught in the door, the brain, there's an impulse, there's a pain impulse that rushes to the brain. Ramosha Feinstein had that pain impulse. But he also had another impulse called sensitivity impulse. And the sensitivity impulse reached the brain just before the pain impulse, or simultaneously. 
and therefore he doesn't yell out. That's why Klai Yisrael compared to stars. The idea of being compared to stars is that the same way that the essence of a star is sensitivity, that's where, that's where the stars are created, that becomes the job of a Jew. The job of a Jew is to make sure that people around us feel better. You should always ask yourself, any interaction you have with another person, by the way, this includes parents, spouses, children, friends, rabbis, anybody. Is this person walk away from me happier or is this person walk away upset? Is he a better person? It's almost like driving in Israel. Somebody once said, when you drive in Israel, you do not get out of that car the same person. You are either a better person or a worse person, but you're not going to be the same person. Probably driving in New York is the same. I'm not sure. My son was, my son went, went to, my wife is from Columbus, Ohio. Not my fault. That's where she's from. And my son was driving. My son was on a trip to Columbus. Columbus is a big, straight, quiet little place. He comes back to Israel. He said, Dad, I, I couldn't drive there. I got to like a four-way stop and everybody waited for me to go. They gave me the right of way, you know, and uh, nobody honked me. I, I couldn't, I was nervous. I, cu I couldn't drive like that. I need Israel, you know. Keep, you know, and then, you know so, so, so when you get out of a car, when you get out of a car, you're not gonna be the same person. You're gonna be a better person or you're gonna be a worse person. You should always ask yourself, in this interaction that I had with somebody, is this person happier for having walked away from me? He's not gonna be the same person. And by the way, the same thing happens, the same thing happens in any areas in life. Is that person that I just entered, it could be a bus driver, it could be your mother-in-law, it could be anybody. Is this person happier for having met me and spoken to me and have something to do with me, or is this person less happy? And that's a very good way to gauge where, how our interpersonal relationships are working. Okay, one more point. The, um, uh, um, in Perak Aleph, take a look at Posse Get Aleph. Hashem Elokei Avosechem Yosef Aleichem Kachem Elech Be'omim Vivorech Eschem Kasher Diber Lachem. So Moshe Rabbeinu, all of a sudden, after giving a, a ten psukim worth of rebuke, all of a sudden he gives a bracha. Hashem, the God of your fathers, should increase you thousandfold. As he spoke to you. Why is Moshe Rabbeinu giving them a bracha now of all times? And the answer is, what did he just do? He just gave them rebuke. What's your reaction when somebody comes and rebukes you? What is the average person when somebody comes over and tells you that you have a flaw, you're doing something wrong? What's your response? You might be embarrassed. My response is to shoot back. Oh yeah, well you're not so great yourself. Right? The Gemara even says that nobody even knows how to give rebuke nowadays. Nobody knows how to take rebuke. If you tell somebody, by the way, you got a splinter between your teeth, the response is you got a cross beam between your eyes. That's how we run, right? When somebody says, you know, you're speaking too much, so well, you're a liar. You know, you know, you know what, what makes you better? That's, that's how we respond. Nobody likes, nobody likes, we like to project ourselves as being the perfect person. Nobody likes to have their flaws pointed out. Yet here Moshe Rabbeinu goes and he gives the Jewish people a rebuke. And the Jewish people, you know, there was a community that was going through some very, there was a community that went through cer certain uh, uh, tragedies happened in the community. So you know, they may, often when this happens, so then the community gets together and decides we have to strengthen this, we have to strengthen our tefillah, so no, no more talking and shul, this, that. You know, different things that the community accepts on themselves. This one community took on one thing. There was one thing that, as a community they agreed on, this was where, the area we're going to work in life. You know what it was? that if somebody ever rebukes you, you don't respond. They're talking about science fiction here. <laughs> uh, one of the most difficult things in the world. Moshe Rabbeinu gives the Jewish people rebuke, and at the end of the rebuke he says to them, now I'm giving you a blessing. You know why? Because I said it to you, and you took it like a man. You didn't respond, you didn't try to defend yourself. You accepted what I said, and you listened to it, you're doing tshuva. For that, I give you the bracha that Hashem should increase you a thousandfold. All right, gentlemen, we'll see you tomorrow.